let me start with the main research question that we're after in this paper. Uh, what we want to know is how much variation in aggregate risk premia can we ascribe to intermediaries? By intermediaries, we mean uh, uh, banks, investment banks, hedge funds, uh, rather than to households. Uh, the the um, two things I want to highlight here is we're going to be focusing on aggregate risk premia, risk premia across broad asset classes, and then this rather than to households. Really, there think of rather than to uh, kind of aggregate fluctuations in, in, in risk aversion. So, so let me try to make this uh, concrete. We know that periods of poor health for financial intermediaries, for financial institutions, times when they get into trouble, tend to be times when risk premia are very high. But those are also times likely when uh, uh, aggregate risk aversion is, is probably high. So it's going to be hard to separate uh, what's coming from which of those two channels. To give a very specific example, um, here's the financial crisis. I have a, just a couple of measures of, uh, 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 of risk premia. I have an MBS spread, uh, a corporate default uh, uh, spread, and the dividend yield for uh, the, the stock market. You can see all of these measures of risk premia spiking dramatically uh, in, in the middle of the crisis. Now, there, there's, there's multiple stories that you could tell, um, but, but the two that we're going to really be thinking about here is uh, one story is that um, large financial institutions got into significant trouble in the financial crisis. Their risk bearing capacity was impaired, and that's what's driving up uh, risk premia in this episode. Now, of course, at the same time, it's very likely that aggregate risk aversion also moved. You, th you could think about that in the context of specific models. Let's say a habits model, consumption is falling, so risk aversion uh, uh, would be rising. Or uh, if you want to think about sentiment, people are becoming overly pessimistic uh, for possibly behavioral reasons. But it, it's, it's, it's very likely that both of these two things uh, were going on. So it's not clear how to interpret this, this rise, coordinated rise in, in risk premium across those asset classes. So what we're going to do in this paper to try to get at this issue is we're going to argue that intermediary risk appetite should matter more for assets that are more difficult for households to directly invest in, and household risk appetite uh, should matter less for these assets. Okay? Um, it's going to deal with the fact that the two measures that we're going to use of intermediary distress uh, uh, and, and unobserved household risk aversion are likely positively correlated. Um, we're going to show you this in, in the context of a model that this is theoretically justified. The model is going to nest a simple version of the two main views. It's going to allow for household risk aversion to change over time, or aggregate risk aversion, and intermediary uh, risk aversion. Um, we, we won't say much about it in the talk uh, right now, but it, the existing tests that we have uh, don't quite get at, at this question. One needs to look at this relative variation in risk premium across the asset classes. And then I'll show you evidence that across asset classes, measures of financial sector health predict returns more strongly in these asset classes that are difficult for households to invest in. So think of uh, uh, things like uh, credit default swaps versus the overall uh, stock market. Um, we'll, we'll look at a couple of household measures. We'll show you that those have the exact opposite pattern. They predict more for out assets that are easier to invest in and, and, and vice versa. Um, so far, all I'm talking about is, is variation and risk aversion. You might be worried about uh, variation, time variation and risk. Um, um, we can control for unobservable, or we can control for, excuse me, observable variation and risk uh, in terms of volatility, skewness, and beta. We'll show that time variation in that is not what's going on in terms of uh, explaining the result. So the, the bottom line is going to be that intermediaries and households appear to have sizable but dis distinct effects uh, on risk premium. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll show you uh, um, a number of results, but the main result will look something like this. So I have uh, the future returns on asset class I on the left-hand side. Those are going to be normalized. I'll tell you how we do that normalization in a second. I have measures of intermediary health on the right-hand side, so uh, the, the leverage factor that I've used uh, for broker-dealers before, and this net worth of uh, uh, primary dealers. Uh, but just think of that as a measure of intermediary health, predicting returns. And then we're going to look at these, the pattern of these coefficients across assets where we're ranking them uh, by sort of how intermediated they are um, or how specialized they are, with stocks kind of on the left, left and then CDS on the right. 
And then we're going to be arguing that this increasing pattern of coefficients um, is, is suggestive that uh, intermediaries are mattering more for, for these asset classes than, than left. I'll show you the same thing when I include proxies for household risk aversion. It will have the exact opposite pattern, downward sloping. And then we're going to use that to try to decompose the volatility of risk premia in these asset classes that we can ascribe to households, which is, I'm plotting in red, and then intermediaries, which I'm plotting uh, in the blue. And we're going to be using this kind of diff and diff approach here. So the low, these are all lower bounds in each asset class. So the lower bound for stocks for intermediaries is going to be zero, because that's what I'm going to base it off of as the least intermediated asset. And then I'm just going to be using how much more these measures predict in CDS than, than stocks to try to get at this variation. For households, it's going to be the opposite uh, uh, pattern. Okay, so a sizable amount of, of variation in risk premia uh, is attributable to each one, and in the way you would kind of expect based on these asset classes. So just an, uh, to talk a little bit briefly about the literature, what we kind of know so far is aggregate asset prices are consistent with the idea that institutions uh, um, or intermediaries might matter. But most of those tests are, uh, are Euler equation tests about intermediary first order conditions. They can't tell you how much of this risk premium you can ascribe across these uh, asset classes. We also have a, lo a lot of local evidence that intermediaries matter for particular asset prices at particular uh, points in time, but it's still not clear how much they matter uh, broadly for these aggregate asset prices. Okay, so let me just highlight the basic ideas before uh, I go into the model. So um, we're going to have time varying risk appetite of intermediaries, which I'm going to call gamma IT, and same with uh, household risk aversion gamma HT. The question that we want to know is whether or not uh, in, in, in this uh, regression here, uh, beta I the, the loading for the um, risk aversion for intermediaries is, is uh, uh, bigger than zero. I'll talk about this normalization that we have on the left-hand side uh, in, a, in a second. The problem is going to be we only observe some proxy for gamma i, and likely that proxy is going to be positively correlated with gamma h. That's what I uh, showed you it kind of in the beginning. Everyone's going to get into bad times kind of at the same time. Um, the the way we're going to try to overcome this is arguing that households face different frictions to invest in each asset class. So beta IH is going to be weakly decreasing um, uh, for more intermediated assets. As we go from less to more intermediated assets, then I can tell whether or not that beta I uh, is, is different from uh, zero, is positive. OK. So the model is going to look something like this. It's going to be really simple just to lay out uh, these, these issues. We're going to have, for now, think of two assets. We're going to have n assets. Uh, asset one, think of as uh, uh, something like the stock market, something that's easy for households to invest in. And asset two, think of some more complex uh, asset class um, that's going to be harder for households to invest in directly. We're going to capture that through these costs, C1 and C2. So think of C1 as being uh, low and C2 as being much higher. So the household can directly invest in asset one, but it's, it's costlier to invest in asset two. Um, we're going to have household risk aversion gamma H and intermediary risk aversion uh, gamma I. So uh, this is going to be a car, car normal framework. Um, there are going to be two frictions going on here. The first friction is that, as I said, assets are going to differ in their ease of direct investment. The way that we're going to capture that is with this quadratic cost C, which might differ across different assets. Um, and the second friction is that intermediaries are going to invest on behalf of households, but possibly with different investment policies. So they're going to have a different risk aversion, potentially gamma I, that might be different from uh, gamma H. So notice here in the household's problem, they're taking into account DI. So they're taking into account that they own the intermediary and are getting risk exposure uh, 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 through them. But it might be costly for them to go around and, and directly invest uh, in these asset classes that they, that they want to. Um, the, the second friction uh, is going to be that there's potentially a wedge in preferences that intermediaries are not going to act as a veil that invest exactly as households want them to uh, uh, in the model. The, the key outcome of the model is going to be this relative predictability. So it's going to be easy uh, to, to jump from those to, to the equilibrium. And I'll just jump to uh, what the model says about this uh, uh, empirical test. So the model is going to say that uh, something pretty intuitive, which is that the change in risk premia for asset class I, 
with respect to a change in intermediary risk aversion, gamma i, that's always going to be weakly increasing, right? Increase in, in uh, risk aversion is going to weakly increase uh, risk premia. But it's going to depend crucially on the CI, the cost across the different asset classes. Um, similarly, for household risk aversion, when I change household risk aversion, risk premia are also going to rise. That's going to decreasingly depend on C, uh, which you can see in the, in the denominator there. So now you can see, if I just had one asset class, and I was running one predictive regression, and I was worried that my gamma I proxy was correlated with gamma H, I wouldn't be able to, to really separate this at all. Okay? But using relative predictability can, can help me separate these two things. So that's what we're going to use. The fact that the first effect is increasing in CI and the second effect is decreasing in CI um, is going to be what's, what's key for our empirical results. So this, this is basically what's going on in the model. You uh, have a, have a um, change in intermediary risk aversion here. For these assets with a high cost where it's hard for households to invest in directly, there's going to be almost no substitution through quantities, and the price is going to fall substantially. For asset class one, where it's easy for the household to invest, uh, intermediary risk aversion increases. The household can easily substitute, and, and prices won't change very much. Okay? So that's exactly what we're using in the data. So now, uh, having said that, I need to make choices about what returns I'm going to use, how I'm going to get variation across asset classes in the, the ease of in investment, and then also which proxies I'm going to use for intermediary distress. So I'm going to use the, the, these two proxies in the, in the literature, um, some based on my own work using changes in broker-dealer leverage, some based on uh, uh, another one based on Hay, Kelly, and Manila. Um, for what I'm going to show you here, we're just going to use an, uh, an average across uh, both of those uh, factors as a joint measure of, of kind of the health of, of these financial intermediaries. And then we don't need household risk aversion for our main results, but I'll show you results where we include household risk aversion proxies as well. Those have the implication that they should have the exact opposite pattern uh, in the data. So I'll, I'll, look, I'll show you um, looking at the habits measure from Campbell and Cochran, looking at CAY. Uh, we have other ones as well. We're happy to include additional things here. What returns am I going to use? Uh, I'm, I'm going to look at stocks, uh, treasury bonds, sovereign bonds, options, commodities, FX, CDS, and then we've, we've uh, uh, just added actually a, a couple more series, um, a, a high minus low yield corporate bond return, uh, and then a mortgage-backed security uh, uh, return as well. We, we think of these as more complex intermediated um, asset classes. And then I'll show you results as well where we look at convertible bond arbitrage returns uh, and fixed income arbitrage as well. Again, things that we think are going to be unlikely for households to invest in directly, we should have effects showing up more there uh, than, than for stocks. Um, normalizing these asset classes is going to be very important. Okay, So we're going to look at two ways to do this normalization. Uh, one is normalizing them by the mean. Okay, so dividing the, the return in the asset class by the unconditional risk premium, and then dividing by the, the volatility. We, we basically just want to account for, we could get an increasing pattern of coefficients if one asset class is just a levered version of another, uh, and, and so forth. The volatility and, and the risk premium uh, uh, normalizations will deal with that fact. The, the risk premium uh, uh, normalizing by the unconditional expected return will deal with any unconditional differences in betas uh, and things like this across the asset classes. Um, okay. So now just to say a note on the, how we do these cost rankings, uh, this is the ranking that we're going to come up with. Um, we, we tried to base this on as many sources as we could. None of them are fully comprehensive in terms of giving us this CI ranking, but basically we went to flow of funds. You can look at household holdings of these different assets, and you can compare that to institutional holdings of these different assets, specifically broker dealers and other financial institutions. And you can see who's holding relatively more of what. That gives us a partial ranking. Uh, and then we did these two other uh, partial rankings uh, as well, looking at value at risk to get intermediary exposures to different asset classes, and looking at this data from the BIS on derivatives of, of, of who's trading uh, in these asset classes. So that gives us uh, uh, this, this ranking here. Let me show you the main results where first I'm normalizing by the, the risk premium. I'll focus on two things, the pattern of coefficients going from left to right, and also the R squareds going from uh, left to right. You can see um, things becoming larger in terms of the size of the coefficients as we're going from left to right, and also statistically more significant. 
And also the same pattern is going on for the R squared for stocks. It's, it's around 1%. Um, for some of these other ones, it's, it's, it's much higher. Um, I put this vertical divide here where, where we have credit and MBS. Those are the two things that we added, um, but they're not incorporated in the ranking. So you shouldn't think of them as ranked eight and ninth uh, in terms of intermediation, but the one through seven ones were based off the, the ranking that we, that we had just done. Okay. Um, here's that main result I showed you. That's just plotting the coefficients from the previous graph. Here's several other uh, metrics that, that you might uh, uh, be interested in. So here's the normalizing by volatility in the second panel. Again, it still gives this uh, relatively increasing uh, uh, pattern. And same with the R squared um, at the bottom. So uh, depending on which normalization you do, you get slightly different results, but still this kind of upward sloping uh, pattern. Now, what would happen if I replace this with a household risk aversion measure? Uh, so here's doing it for CAY, same, same thing for habits though. You actually get a downward sloping pattern. That's exactly what the model uh, uh, or, or, or idea would have uh, uh, predicted, that it would matter more for things that are easier for households to invest in and less for the harder things. So now we're gonna use that in a panel regression framework. We're gonna have interactions um, for how intermediated the asset classes are. So that's what those dummies are in that interaction term. We're gonna include household risk aversion uh, as well. Uh, let me show you those results. So there are different ways to do those dummies. Let me focus on the last one, um, which is just doing a rank of the asset classes from left to right, from one to seven. What you can see is this interaction term being positive and significant. That's consistent with what I showed you earlier of an increasing pattern of coefficients across the asset classes. Uh, for, for gamma H, for this household risk aversion proxy, you actually see a negative coefficient on the interaction term consistent with the downward sloping uh, pattern. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna use this to try and decompose the variation in risk premia attributable to each one of those. We're only gonna be using the interaction terms to do that uh, uh, decomposition. For, uh, for example, the, the, the non-interaction term for, for gamma i, we don't know whether or not to ascribe that to intermediaries or households. So we're only gonna use this uh, difference. And that's where I come up with this graph uh, here. So again, these are lower bounds just based on that interaction uh, term. We're getting a significant amount of risk premia ascribed to intermediaries in the blue for the more intermediated assets and the opposite thing for, for households uh, in the red. Um, I, I don't have time to talk too much about the robustness, but I'll just point you to, to this in the paper. Uh, let me just address one issue of time-bearing risk. So, so far we've all talked about time-bearing risk aversion. Um, maybe it's that these measures line up with time variation and risk in the right way. So the concern here would be that the more intermediated asset classes happen to become more risky exactly when the intermediary health is poor. That's, that's the issue that we, that we would have to deal with. Um, we we do, do this in a few ways, I'll just show you one. We just see whether or not those measures predict uh, future variance, whether or not the pattern of loadings maps to the pattern of loadings that I showed you before, and, and we don't find that uh, here. Um, we look at skewness, we look at all sorts of different uh, ways of measuring risk. Again, we can only control or deal with observable variation in risk, um, but we don't find anything there. And then I'll, I'll say one thing uh, quickly about um, additional evidence from hedge fund returns. Uh, again, this is, this is an area where we would think intermediary health would particularly matter, and it's probably hard for households to invest in these uh, directly. Uh, and, and we see something like this. So, uh, for things like convertible bond arbitrage, fixed income arbitrage, uh, we see a lot of predictability from these intermediary measures. We see a lot less for uh, the overall stock market. So again, this is different data that's, that's consistent with the main uh, idea. So let me, let me conclude here. Uh, do intermediaries matter for aggregate asset prices? Uh, we argue the answer is yes. Households too, but they have these kind of distinct patterns uh, across these different asset classes. Intermediary risk appetite should matter more for assets that are more difficult to directly invest in. That's exactly what we find empirically, and the opposite being true for, uh, for, for household risk.